Well, please take your Bibles and turn with me to Esther chapter 5. Esther chapter 5. We've been making our way through the book of Esther together, and last week we left off at a climactic moment in the story. One of those hold-your-breath moments in the story of Esther where her life is hanging in the balance. In fact, in some ways... You might say that Esther 5 reads kind of like this. Let's see if you can guess uh, what illustration I'm trying to give you here. It's a really good one, so you've got to wait for it. Confession, the locals will have a leg up on this. comes the double dip. There it is. All right. But what is it? Kennywood. So if you failed to read the title on the top of the video, uh, then some of you may recognize well that uh, famous Jackrabbit roller coaster. Raise your hand if you've been on the Jackrabbit before. Come on now. Yeah, I thought so. Uh, built in 1920, so for more than a century, folks have been enjoying this wooden roller coaster, and it's been given delight to Pittsburghers and folks from afar off. Uh, the the uh, the Jackrabbit, it's uh, it's just a local favorite. In fact, my daughter Sophie just got to christen the Jackrabbit this year. I feel like she's she's finally in as a Pittsburgher now. I, it was it was funny as we were waiting in line, she was just all bubbly and excited and she was you know how she kinda gets excited and talk, 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 talk. And then by the time we got to the seat and sat in the cart, she was a little bit more somber and she was like like plastered up against the side of my body. Uh, and then uh, when we got off the roller coaster, I right, caught our breath and we walked out. We kind of ran over to that little booth where they take your picture halfway through. You know how, you know how those things are set up? And I was looking and I, I began to panic a little bit because I could see myself, no Sophie, next, <laughs> next to me. Well, well that, the, when I looked a little closer in the picture, I could see the very tip of her blonde hair showing because she was literally like in my lap. Um, her first big person roller coaster experience. So, so, so what's my point here, if you're, if you're connecting the dots? Why am I presuming to say to you this morning that Esther chapter 5 reads a bit like a roller coaster ride? Well, it's because the faithful reader of Esther, the careful reader of the book of Esther, should begin this chapter with a knot in his or her stomach. Because you need to remember where we left off last week. So if, if you're there in Esther 5, and I encourage you to be, we're going to be really uh, taking time to make all of our observations from the text. Then, uh, then just look back a verse or two, and you'll see we left off with Queen Esther's courageous declaration. Chapter 4, verse 16, I'm going to the king, though it's against the law, and if I perish... So, we are white-knuckling the safety bar, as it were, as we are beginning Esther chapter 5, and spoiler alert, just as we start to catch our breath from Esther's life-or-death experience here, the sovereign hand of God sends us plunging down around another curve, uh, and we've got more excitement on the horizon. I mean, at, at the end of the chapter here, we've, we're wondering whether our very own Mordecai is going to live past the morning. So, so Esther 5 opens with, oh no, Esther's going to die. Exhale. Oh wait, 
Mordecai is going to die. It's just a, it's a wild ride. So let's, let's dive into the text here and we'll read together. Esther chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. On the third day, that is the third day of fasting, before she went to the king, all the Jews were alerted to, to, to fast, to, to intercede on, on her behalf. On the third day, Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the king's palace in front of the king's quarters, while the king was sitting on his royal throne inside the throne room opposite the entrance to the palace. And when the king saw Queen Esther standing in the court without being summoned, his heart was filled with wrath. So Esther died a martyr's death there before the king, and the Jews still sing about her sacrifice to this day. No? Is that not what your Bible says? Of course, it's not what your Bible says. What, what am I doing? I'm not just trying to be a smart aleck up here. I'm certainly not trying to be irreverent as it, uh, as it pertains to the reading of God's word. I'm trying to make a simple point. And the point is this. It's possible for us to sit quite comfortably here reading Esther chapter 5 without so much as an ounce of tension. Why? Well, because we know the end, don't we? We know the ending of the story, so let me just state the obvious as we're reading through the text, reading through Esther 5. Queen Esther does not know. She's got no idea how this thing is about to go down. This was, in a very real sense, a life or death moment. And friends, we need to remember that because I think there's some application for us as the people of God here in 2022 to draw for, uh, into our lives today. So let's, let's pick back up and let's read what really happened here in verse 2. Esther 5, verse 2. Esther's coming before the king. And when the king, verse 2, saw Queen Esther standing in the court, she won favor. That word is grace in the Hebrew. She found favor or grace in his side. And he held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. Then Esther approached and touched the tip of its scepter. And the king said to her, what is it, Queen Esther? What is your request? It shall be given you even to the half of my kingdom. Whew. Right? <laughs> Exhale. The golden scepter has been extended to Queen Esther. Her life has been spared. And now some of you are asking here at the end of this verse, verse 3, what's up with this up to half my kingdom line? I mean, we read ch chapter 1, right? King Ahasuerus is loaded. He's the, the sovereign potentate over 127 provinces stretching across three continents Almost 5 million square acres worth of land. Up to half of that? Well, th this was an expression. Uh, I, I'm not sure what would have happened if Esther would have been like, you know what, that's a really good idea. I'll take half the kingdom, actually. Uh, that, that just didn't happen. This was a, a, a mode of speaking, a, a manner of expression that was not meant to be taken Literally, and we've got these idioms in our language today, right? Like, I'll love you to the moon and back. Who's said that? You know, whispering to your kids before they go to, go to sleep at night. Who's done that, right? Nobody's been to the moon and back here in this room, I would assume. Uh, loving their children. There's raining cats and dogs, which would be quite entertaining, I think. It just a, it's a figure of speech. What, what's the king saying? The king is saying that he is inclined to be generous and to give Queen Esther whatever it is she's there to ask for. Another example, a tragic example of this very same phrase used by another king in the New Testament can be found in Mark chapter 6, where King Herod uses that phrase when his illegitimate wife Herodias his daughter had danced before him he says whatever you want up to half the kingdom and after consulting her mother she comes back with John the Baptist's head on a platter All right let's let's circle back and now that we're understanding the the context the situation the, the the wording here let's circle back to the point that we were hitting at just a moment ago that that Esther is in very real very grave danger you know we can 
logically understand this. I, I, I hope we all logically understand that Esther's life was in danger. But the question is, not whether we logically understand it, but whether we theologically understand this. Whether we theologically understand the, the implications of this spiritual principle. The principle that in life and in faith, God's people are not always shielded from peril, are they? Not always shielded from, from danger, from loss, from, from risk. Now here's an interesting exercise. You want some, some homework this week? Go make a list as you thumb through the Bible of all the biblical characters you can think of who were put in situations and had to demonstrate faith through very real risk and danger to themselves. And you could play all day on that question. The list of biblical characters who as God was working by his power, through his spirit, by his grace, throughout the, the reams of re redemptive history, we can see example after example after example of people who God loved greatly and yet did not shield from risk, from sorrow, from loss. Think of Gideon. We studied through the judges uh, a year or so ago. Gideon, uh, when, when he fought that decisive victory, had one Israelite soldier for every 450 Midianite soldiers. That's a suicide mission. Great personal danger for our boy Gideon. How about Elijah? I mean, you, you could talk about David or, or not, not long before uh, the events in Esther that we're reading now, there was... The book of Daniel and, and the kingdom of Babylon. Think about Daniel and the risk to his life and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Th th think about all of the people in God's word. This is instructive to us. Here's, here's the uncomfortable point that God brought Esther to. This, this question, Esther, will you give up your life for me? For, for what I'm calling you to do. That's the question Esther had to answer. And it cost her sleep. I'm sure. I'm sure it cost her stress. And it could have in no uncertain terms cost her her life. Her skin. Please don't miss this church. This question. Is not just intended for, for Esther. But in a very real sense. We are posed the same question. By Jesus himself. You know your savior. The, the Lord of lords. The king of kings Jesus. Does not differentiate between. Radical followers of him. And, and just regular followers. There's no asterisk. In scripture. He calls his people to follow. Listen, listen to the words of our master. Matthew 16. 24 and 25. Jesus says. If anyone. Would come after me. Who? So that presumably is you. Right? If anyone's going to follow me. That's, that's me. He must deny himself. Take up his cross. What's going on there? Death. That's what's going on there. He must say no to himself. He, he must die to his old way of life. He must deny himself. Take up his cross. Third step. Follow me. For whoever wants to save his life. Will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me. Will find it. Who's Jesus talking about? He's talking about all of us. There's not a single follower of Christ. Who doesn't need to do these three things. Deny. Die. And follow. What's the point? What's. Our Savior teaching us. Well, he's teaching us that the Christian life involves risk. It involves sacrifice. It would be appropriate to borrow the words from the theologian turned martyr, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Bonhoeffer wrote before he was killed by the Nazis. When Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. Isn't that what Jesus Says to us, come to me, but you can't come to me clinging to anything else of you. You've got to deny yourself. You've got to die to yourself and you've got to follow where I 
leave. Listen, friends, Esther did not know what would happen around the corner. The risk was real. And similarly, we don't know, do we? Can you see around the bend in your life? We don't know what will happen in our own micro stories. But we can have confidence, as Esther did, in knowing that our God wins. We're not shielded from risk. Let's let's continue here in the story. Pick up in verse 4. Esther chapter 5, verse 4. We'll read to verse 8. And Haman, oh, I'm sorry. That's verse 9. Let me, let me find verse 4. I can count. Here we go. Uh, here we go. Uh, so Esther's been spared. Verse 4, and Esther said, If it please the king, let the king and Haman come today to a feast that I have prepared for the king. And the king said, Bring Haman quickly, so we may do as Esther has asked. So the king and Haman came to the feast that Esther had prepared. And as they were drinking wine after the feast, the king said to Esther, What is your wish? It shall be granted you. And what is your request? Even, he repeats it, even to half my kingdom, it shall be fulfilled. And then Esther, verse 7, answered, my wish and my request is, if I found favor in the sight of my king, and if it please the king to grant my wish and fulfill my request, let the king and Haman come to the feast that I will prepare for them. And tomorrow I will do as the king has said. So, are you following? The the king has extended the scepter to his queen. He's extended grace. Esther lives. And he, he goes so far as to say, you've won such favor in my sight, Esther. Ask whatever you want. Up to half my kingdom, I'll, I'll, I'll give it. Now, be honest. How many of you were thinking that her answer was going to be a banquet? Probably not what you were imagining her response would be. If we're honest, maybe a bit anticlimactic, right? Is is that what we're feeling at at this moment? I mean, Esther has been spared. Her life has been spared. But the fate of the entire Jewish nation, let's remember, is still hanging in the balance. There is a decree signed and sealed with the king's signet ring that all the people of God, the, the, the Jewish nation, should be eradicated. Esther, remember now, went to the king's presence in the first place to plead for her people. And yet here, she's asking for a banquet. Interesting, isn't it? The, uh, uh, there's a lot of questions and a lot of ink spilled, honestly, about why Esther m- might not in that very moment have come out and just spilled the question, spilled her request before the king to spare her people. And yet, we'll soon see as we look ahead that God, his invisible hand, his divine fingerprints, his providence is, is guiding this process all the way through. We'll, we'll see in just a moment that if Esther had asked here, the table would not have been set for the deliverance of God's people, half of, of what God does uh, in the future. We're about to see gallows built. We're about to see the king rem- remembering how precious and honored Mordecai is. And his heart is inclined to do something special for him. None of these things are in play if Esther had popped the question here. So so why does Esther not ask the king here? Well, the, the, the answer is absent. It's silent in the text. We're not exactly sure why, but we see God working his providential hand like, like a chess master behind the scenes. And, and we get this. I, I think we get this, that sometimes there's a thing that could be the, the right thing at the wrong time. You've lived through experiences like this, right? It's, it's the right thing, but God hasn't, hasn't brought you to the right space or the right time to work that thing out. I'll give you a simple illustration. It reminds me of the time I was asking for my wife Lindsay's hand in marriage. My father-in-law Bruce is here, I think. I, I saw Bruce. There he is, nodding at me from the back. He knows what's coming. 
So, uh, so my wife and I were living in uh, Atlanta, Georgia, as we were engaged to be married, and, and I wanted to do things the right way, the traditional way. I, I wanted to ask Lindsay's father for his, his permission, for, for her hand in marriage, and, uh, and I didn't want to do it with a phone call originally. So, I, <laughs> so, so uh, we're visiting Pittsburgh, as we would, uh, you know, from, t- from time to time, at some kind of break. I was a teacher at, at the time and a coach, and uh, we're, we're up on break visiting, and, uh, and I have been preparing for this question with Bruce. And so we're, we're out at a driving range hitting golf balls. It's something Bruce loves to do. I thought, hey, that'd be a great, great place to ask the question, right? And I know nothing, confession, nothing about golf. And so, as you can imagine... He's trying to instruct me in the finer points, of, or just even the basic points of hitting that, <laughs> that ball off the tee. And my mind is somewhat occupied on other things. And I finally psych myself up to ask the question. Right? I say to myself, All right, after this next ball, after I hit this next ball, I'm just going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to let the question go. I'm going to ask it. And I pulled back and brought that club down, thinking about how I was going to start that, that next sentence. And grounded that driver right into the ground and snapped it in half. Now, I neglected to tell you that I don't own golf clubs. They were his. And I made an executive decision in that moment. It is not the right time. (laughs) Right question, wrong time. I, mean, I don't know how I would have recovered from that. I promised to treat your, your daughter better than your golf clubs. I don't know. I mean, so uh, Bruce was very gracious, as he always is, very generous. And, and so uh, we, we finished up, and I went back to Atlanta and called him a couple weeks later when I could get the nerve uh, and, and asked for Lindsay's hand in marriage. What's my point? There's such a thing as a right thing at the wrong time. And Esther here knows what she has to do, and yet the, the pieces of the puzzle, as it were, have not come together yet. Let's, uh, let, let's keep rolling here. The, uh, the right thing at the wrong time. I, I, one, one final observation about the, uh, the question of Esther's question uh, that's, that's probably worth noting before we move on, and it's this. We should, we should note the weight of what Esther is prepared to ask. All right, think about this for a moment. The, the, the request that she's going to make to the king to spare her people is no small thing. It will require a change in royal law, which, by the way, the, with the laws of the uh, Medes and the Persians could not be revoked. We hear that ad nauseum as we're reading through the beginning and the end of the text. The integrity of the king. She was asking the integrity of the king to be called into question. I seal this document, this law, with my signet ring. Oh, just kidding. He loses face with the entire nation. Not to mention the expense of this edict and all the money that will be lost. I I think one uh, biblical commentator, Do Good, the former Grove City professor, captures this idea well. Listen to what he says about the weight of Esther's question and why this request was so massive. Do Good writes, consider the numerous challenges that faced Esther. First, she was asking for the reversal of an irreversible law which had been sponsored by the most powerful man in the empire and signed with the king's own signet ring. Granting her a request would cost the king 10,000 talents, less than half his empire to be sure, but as much as half the annual tax revenue of his empire And no small sum. Perhaps even worse though. It would be hard for the king to grant her request without losing face. Since the edict was officially authorized by his own royal person. Are you feeling, friends, the weight of Esther's request? She's biding her time. She's going to ask at the right moment. And God providentially leads her to that point later. In the meantime, we've got banquet number one. The king says after he's finishing his food and and merriment with Haman, drinking wine, are you ready yet? What's your request? She says, one one more, one more of these. I want to invite you back to a banquet tomorrow, and we'll have to pick up that scene next time. Let's let's continue reading because there is a a scene shift at this point here in verse 9. Let's finish up the passage here. We'll read to the end of chapter 5. Esther 
5, 9 to the end. And Haman went out that day, that is the day after the, the first banquet, joyful and glad of heart. But when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate, that he neither rose nor trembled before him, he was filled with wrath against Mordecai. Nevertheless, Haman restrained himself and went home, and, and he sent and brought his friends and his wife Zeresh, and Haman recounted to them the splendor of his riches, the number of his sons. Presumably his wife already knew that information. Um, anyway, he's, he's boasting. You see here, verse 11, he recounted to them the splendor of his riches, the number of his sons, all the promotions with which the king had honored him, and how he advanced him above all the officials and the servants of the king. Verse 12, then Haman said, said, even Queen Esther, let no one but me come with the king to the feast she prepared. And tomorrow also I'm invited by her together with the king. Yet, watch this pivot here in verse 13 now. Yet, I'm second in command over this vast empire. No one's been honored like me. No one has what I have. Rah, 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 rah. Verse 13. Yet, all this is worth nothing to me. Nothing. So long as I see Mordecai, the Jew, sitting at the king's gate. And his wife Zeresh and all his friends said to him, Let a gallows, 50 cubits high, be made. And in the morning, tell the king to have Mordecai hanged upon it. And go joyfully with the king to the feast. This idea pleased Haman. And he had the gallows made. Wow. I feel like I'm on that double dip. If you remember that jackrabbit roller coaster ride. We've just given a, a collective exhale. Because Esther was spared. And a few sentences later what do we find? Mordecai the other. Uh, main character in the story, the other Jew here representing the people of God is going to die on a high, high gallows. We'll unpack that in just a minute in the morning, in the morning. Now, this is where the text leaves us here in chapter five. Stomach and knots again, all over again. We'll have to revisit and resolve some of that tension next week in chapter six. Um, the gallows, I want to draw your attention to verse 14. It's worth noting here that we begin to see this word echo throughout the book of Esther. What's fascinating is that if you remember, the, the name of God appears precisely zero times, goose egg times in the book of Esther. God's name is never mentioned, and yet this word, Word gallows in the Hebrew occurs nine times. One commentator, I think, winsomely says it, the word gallows haunts the text from beginning to end here in, in Esther. Now, now, you have to remember as well, we encountered ga the gallows way back in chapter 1 when two would-be assassins were plotting against King Ahasuerus. And we saw then that the word gallows simply means a wooden pole or a spike. And given what we know at, at, at this time, it, it's very likely, the text doesn't spell out exactly what happened, but, but it's, it's likely that this type of gallows would not be a, a, a gallows with a rope to hang someone, but rather a grotesque wooden pole used to impale criminals and elevate them up in the air for everyone to see as an example. This is what happens when you mess with Persia. Again, there's, there's plenty of evidence of this happening in the Medo-Persian Empire. I, I'll spare you the visual aids right now. You can go do a Google search if you're gruesome and twisted, I guess. <laughs> The gallows, the gallows. So, so Haman receives from his wife and from his friends, his counselors, this terrible idea, this sick idea. Go take this guy, Mordecai, this, this guy who refuses to bow, refuses to tremble in your presence. Build a gallows. How, how, how big? 
50 cubits high. You know how, how high a cubit was? Hold up your hand. Okay, measure the distance between your elbow and your finger. That's a cubit. Wasn't real standardized then, but, but, but somewhere between, somewhere in the vicinity of 18 inches, and you, you just do the math, a, a cubit ends up being about 75 feet high. Now, I think sometimes when we start getting into high numbers, they can be hard for our simple brains to compute. You know how high 75 feet is? Look up. See the highest point in this room? Anyone want to venture a guess at how high that peak of the sanctuary is? Less than 30. We're not going to tell you how we measured this. It was <laughs> it's a bit interesting. 22 feet to the peak of that ceiling. So triple it and then some. You getting in your head the idea? 75 feet. This grotesque wooden spike to impale Mordecai would have been higher than any tree there in the, in the Middle East, in the ancient Near East. They would have towered above any building that was present. They're making a statement here of Mordecai and of Haman's great pride. You feel in the weight of what's about to happen to our boy Mordecai. This is, this is not a good day. This is bad news for Mordecai. But before we move on, I want us to notice one more thing about, about Haman, the adversary, the, the enemy of the Jews, as uh, the book has described him here. Notice how fickle and how vain this man, Haman, the Agagite, is. Look back at verse 13 with me. Verse 13. 13 of Esther 5. After boasting of the singularity of his wealth, of his great position, of his honor in the kingdom, nobody can, can match up against Haman, save the king. He says after you know, airing out the laundry list of his achievements, yet all this stuff is worth nothing to me. So long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's table. Now, question. Did Mordecai's failure to bow to Haman change Haman's power one ounce? It changed his favor before the king. Did it change his spot on the org chart of the Medo-Persian Empire? No. No. Remember, Haman has already plotted the destruction not only of Haman, or excuse me, Haman has plotted not only this destruction, he would plot his own destruction, uh, but the destruction of Mordecai. He's going to wipe out the entire Jewish people. There is a date set on the calendar, and Haman's already spelled out the destruction of Mordecai. But that's not enough to him. Because one man fails to bow and worship, to, to show him reverence as it were, Everything belonging to Haman is for naught. I love how the Reformed Expository Commentary puts it. This is, this is good. The, uh, their observation is this about the, the fickle, the vain Haman. What a ridiculous overreaction. Yet are we not equally fickle? Turn the microscope in for a moment. Shouldn't our joy and our salvation be far more impregnable than Haman's because it's based on the unparalleled glory of God's incredible goodness to us? In reality, though, how often have we said to ourselves, listen now, yes, I know that God has made me his child and a co-heir of Christ's glorious inheritance. Yet all this is worth nothing to me. As long as I do not have, fill in the relevant comfort or security. You see what we're saying? Haman's great pride. Haman's massive ego is, and his fickle hubris made it such that he couldn't, he couldn't enjoy any of the honors 
that he had been given because this one thing was out of alignment, which didn't seismically impact anything real in his life other than his pride, Haman was prepared to throw everything else away. Nothing else mattered until he could fix that one thing. And friends, with grace and with kindness, I hope I can say, as the pastor here at Friendship Community Church, that we're not at like the Haman level of plotting, right? The eradication of an entire people group. But might we sometimes be guilty of the same kind of fickle, misaligned priorities so that we might say, taking a page from Haman's book, yeah, 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 I know that God has eternally saved me from certain sin and death in an unthinkable, unimaginable hell that I deserve. I know that he sent his very son to bleed and die in my stead. I know that I've been given the Holy Spirit of God as a deposit, as an inheritance to do in my life what I could never do on my own. And I know that I've been given an inheritance that will never spoil or fade or perish. Kept in heaven for me. Yet right now, all that's but nothing to me. So long as fill in your job problem. Fill in your family problem. Without minimizing, friends, the pain we wade through in this life. Oh, how the book of Esther convicts me. I hope you feel a twinge of conviction as well. Because we ought to be, friends, the most joyful people on the planet. Regardless of the circumstances that bracket us, that surround us. People who understand the glory of what has been given to us in Jesus. Is it possible, friends, that we could be letting certain earthly disappointments cloud our view of the massive truth which should define us? our identity, our inheritance in Jesus Christ. Let me give you a, just a, a, a biblical reminder. I'm giving this to myself. I need this just as much as the next guy. I'm going to read to you, before we round out our time together, a passage from the New Testament, which gives you just a slice, just a, just a taste, a description of our eternal inheritance that awaits us in Jesus. And I pray and I hope that this would be an encouragement to you. Regardless of what you're facing. To remember. It ends well for you. In Jesus. As we like to say around here. Let's, let's read. You, you can turn to 1 Peter 1 if you want. Or you can just keep yourself here in Esther. We're about to finish there. And just close your eyes and drink this in. This is true about you. Follower of Jesus. 1 Peter 1. 3-7. to 7. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope. To a hope that's got a heartbeat. A living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To an inheritance, listen now, that's imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Who by God's power are being guarded. You know that? In Christ you're being guarded through faith. For a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice. Though now for a little while if necessary. You've been grieved by various trials. So that the tested genuineness of your faith. More precious than gold. That perishes though it's tested by fire. May be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Do you remember, Christian, who you are? Do you remember what you've been given? 
may we be bold. May we be people who who filter the grid of our experiences, our circumstance through the lens of this identity, of this great inheritance. Because he who began the work in you, Christian, is God enough. He will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. He's good for it. Let's, let's not play the Haman card. I'm talking to myself. All right, last thing. I'd like us to end our time here this morning by contrasting what I'll call the access between two very different kings. Think for a moment about the difference in access between what it took to approach mighty King Ahasuerus and what it takes to approach Almighty God, the King of Kings. And Lord of Lords. Friend, think about the trepidation that Esther, who was the queen, the trepidation, the fear, the uncertainty that she had as she came trembling before King Ahasuerus. And now, just for a moment, think of the certainty we have in approaching a far greater king. Doesn't the gospel make you want to just fall down on your face and worship Jesus? Because he's given you a level of access which you cannot possibly comprehend. You can't plumb the depths of this access. Do you understand how high and holy our God is? Do you understand that He can't look on sin. There's not a one of us there who could stand in the presence of the Most High God and get anything but death as our just reward. And because Jesus bled and died for you, because Jesus, the greater Esther, humbled himself because he took every risk every every consequence upon his own shoulder and gave us his righteousness hebrews tells us we can approach the throne of grace we read it a moment ago in our worship with confidence confidence before that king to receive mercy and grace to help in time of need think about the glory Of the gospel all over again. It's not as if our entrance to the king's presence was free. No, there's no cheap, no no easy access. One more quote from that biblical scholar, Ian Duguid. He puts it this way. Our entry to the heavenly court is free. But it was certainly not cheaply bought. As sinners, a death is required before we can enter the presence of an all-holy one. God can hold out the golden scepter of favor to us only because the fierce rod of his judgment has fallen on Christ. Friends, in Christ, we have an open door policy. We ought to use it. We ought to come before the presence of our maker, our redeemer, our treasure. And we ought to sing, as we're about to sing in just a moment. I'm going to invite Ruth Ann up, and she's going to lead us in a final song. Before the throne of God above. Before the throne of the highest God. The highest king. I have a strong and perfect plea. A great high priest who na- whose name is love. Whoever lives and pleads for me. Think about the access we've been granted. And let us meditate on that. Let us chew on the goodness of our God and the grace of the gospel. As we walk out these doors in just a moment and hit our week afresh. Asking the Lord for his help, for his guidance by the power of his spirit. Let's pray.
Lord, we love you, and we come before you now, and we say thank you, thank you, thank you for the gospel. Thank you for Jesus, the one who stood in our stead and took the wrath that we deserved, that we could be called sons and daughters of the Most High God. Lord, we pray now that as we sing and as we fellowship with one another and, and as we seek to order our lives rightly this week, that you would give us the grace of perspective. I'd give us a joy that transcends our circumstances. And Father, help us to trust that you, as you have in Esther, you will marshal all of human history. And yes, our stories too, for your glory and the good of your people in Christ. We pray in his great name. Amen.